This time, we're starting part one of Best of the Rest for Nintendo Power. We're going through basically as many games from the now playing column of Nintendo Power's sixth year as we can reasonably go through, this time with a focus on action games and platformers. Family Dog has the same general vibe as Home Alone 2 Lost in New York, where you're moving from left to right through incredibly cluttered environments. This makes sense if the developer, Imagineering Entertainment, also developed Home Alone 2 as well. The controls are a little rough, no pun intended. Height of jumps is based on direction press with the jump, with the character able to move from side to side in midair on the high jumps. This leads to a few problems because you can either do big forward leaps or high jumps with from side to side adjustment, but you can't do anything in between. No middle of the road jumps from side to side. Further, as with Home Alone 2, your attack verb is li more limited in quantity, but you only have one of them, barking. Having had a dog, I can say with a certain degree of knowledge and expertise that dogs bark more than a little bit. And that's not just talking about little dogs. I had a big dog. So, I have to say, while this game has character, it's not a great game. I really recommend giving it a miss. Wizard of Oz is the worst thing a game can be. Boring. It's slow-paced, monotonous, and it managed to take the wonderful songs from the original film and run them straight into the ground. If I had to bloody-mindedly plow through the game to its conclusion, I think this would make me hate the soundtrack of the movie because I'd be so sick of the music. And that is quite possibly the greatest crime of all. At least for this game. Dream TV appears, at first glance, to be a port of a platformer for the Amiga, but no, this is exclusive to the Super Nintendo. The concept is interesting, you switch between two characters as you try to navigate through various environments to collect items for a witch. However, the game's controls are pretty rough, with several environments that seem designed to cause cheap hits, combined with it not being clear what the two characters do differently in terms of a gameplay, if they do do anything differently. By comparison, The Lost Vikings, at the very least, made it clear what each character's unique verb was, and how you needed to use them to get through the game's environments. This game does nothing of the sort. Pink Goes to Hollywood is a pretty good concept for a platformer. Much as with the Tiny Toons Montana's Movie Madness game, it takes the idea of a film studio and the Pink Panther running around it, and using that concept to string together various levels. Where Thing stumbles with the execution, as with a bunch of other platformers based on cartoons, including the Tiny Toons games, Pink Goes to Hollywood has an issue with inertia. In particular, the field of the view of the game is too far in, causing you to have issues picking up speed and running into enemies before you have a chance to react. On the Game Boy, this is a common issue, as dealing with sprite size in the field of view is a balancing act that even the best developers like Konami have problems with. But this is a title for the Super Nintendo, and by this time, I mean, oh, hell, you're on a television, you have a nice big field of view. There's really no excuse here. Further, you can really only take two hits before you die, and I didn't encounter any power-ups in the game that let you take another hit again, a problem that Super Mario Bros. has solved a long time ago. My theory for these issues is this. The Super Nintendo is able to display larger, more detailed, more animated sprites than the NES could. This led developers wanting to showcase the power of these new 16-bit consoles, because this comes up on the Genesis and the Turbo Graphics as well, to push for larger sprites, leading to the Super Nintendo to run some into run into some of the issues that we've been running into on the Game Boy. And again, this comes up on the Genesis, it comes up on the Derpo graphics. This is not an issue that is unique to the Super Nintendo. It's an across-the-board 16-bit thing. We'll see if this issue is borne out more over the episode and future episodes in this little chunk. Time Slip is a run-and-gun action game like Contra 3. The game's controls are really good, with one fire button that has you firing while moving, and another that lets you lock down your movement and adjust your fire in multiple directions, which is perfect for handling bosses. Where things fall apart, though, is with how the continue system works. Or rather, the lack of a continue system. While you have 10 lives, you also have no continues, nor, near as I can tell, 
Has anyone figured out a Game Genie code to give you infinite lives to make up for the lack of continues? Well, I said this before, I'll say it again, but there's always someone's first episode. Home console games shouldn't have limited continues. Continues are shorthand for a quarter that has been fed into an arcade machine. If you're playing a game at home on a console, you are effectively in a situation where you own the arcade machine and can, if you so choose, set the machine to free play. I have no problem with having an option to limit your con to give yourself limited continues as a way of upping the difficulty. But if it's your home machine, home game, you should be able to adjust the difficulty and adjust the number of continues in a way that you so choose. And in this case also, there's less excuse because this game never received an arcade release and went straight to consoles. So it's not even the excuse here of, oh, this game is deliberately replicating the exact difficulty of the arcade game. There was none. When I first saw the screenshots of Out to Lunch, my first thought was, this is a game that is a spiritual sequel to Panic Restaurant. Sadly, this is not the case. Instead, it's a very vertically oriented platformer based around collecting a certain number of food ingredients and depositing them in a receptacle to open the exit. There really isn't much of a risk of death in this game. Outside of not collecting enough stuff before time runs out, making the game more of a puzzle platformer than anything else. That said, some of the platforming early on can be infuriating as the first few episodes are split between conventional platforming and the ice level, some of which combine being an ice level with precise platforming. It's okay. If I ended up getting a copy on a grab bag and didn't own a copy, I wouldn't shove it in my trade pail file, but I, I wouldn't hunt down a copy either. It's... The problem is with the ice physics and precise platforming, they don't go well together because when you're doing precise, narrow platforms, you're going to inevitably slide off, slide off them almost right away because that's the way how ice physics work, or fail to work, rather, in most platforms. Moving briefly to the Game Boy, Popeye 2 steps away from the original arcade game into a more conventional platform and works reasonably well. The controls are good and the level design generally works, though there are a few issues with the attack arc of Popeye's Punch. In general, it's a decent enough platform for the Game Boy, it's nothing special, but as with the previous game, if I came across the copy at a decent price or got it in a bunch, I'd probably hang on to it. Asterix and Obelix got preview coverage in Nintendo Power, but never received a US release. So I'm covering it anyway. As it is, this game is a decent platformer, but it has a few notable issues. The game has no checkpointing, and it's a little obscure over how you select your player. You have to go to the options menu instead of getting to choose between Asterix or Obelix when you start the game itself. Other than that, it really captured the spirit of the comic strip well, and it's kind of a bummer that this game never got a US release. I think it could have done well and introduced new audiences to the two guys from Gaul. Alfred Chicken is an okay platformer. As with a lot of other platformers that have made it into the best of the rest, that's the sort of jumping I associate with PC and Amiga platformers with high and floaty jumps, but it leans into that by having the mascot be a bird and being able to float for those jumps. So unlike in those games, here the jumping physics feels somewhat natural. Where things fall apart, though, is with some of the difficulty. Alfred dies in one hit, and there isn't particularly any other way for your character to get additional hits. Again, this is a problem that Mario figured out early on, but this game still doesn't get. This isn't helped by a limited number of continues, though the game does add a password system to the mix, which helps, but still isn't ideal. Mr. Nuts is an unfortunately named mascot platform with a cutesy design style with a few sharp edges, like the piranha plot print knockoffs in this game's second level. The controls are okay, and the level design and physics feel like a much better fit for the Super Nintendo than a lot of other games thus far. Unless the game gets really messed up in later portions, I'd almost consider this something of a hidden gem. I say almost, because copies of this game will cost you over a hundred bucks on eBay, which is about as much as some actual gems will cost you. I don't mean gems in the Super Nintendo's library, I mean gemstones that people dug out of the ground. And yeah, that kind of gem. Finally, we have Super James Pond. James Pond is weird. It's like the whole concept of the series is born out of a pun that someone scribbled on a bar napkin, but ended up having nothing to do with the outgrowth of, of, of that pun. The character's name is James Pond, and he's an anthropomorphic fish, but he doesn't have a weapon, 
and the environments in, at least in this game, have nothing really spy-ish to them. Some googling finds a spy-related story in the manual, but it doesn't fit at all into the game's presentation, it's just a mascot platformer. Additionally, the gameplay is just okay, it's not good, it's just bad, it's just fair. It feels like gameplay-wise, this would have been a really big deal on the Amiga, but on the Super Nintendo, when frankly, there are just so many other platformers, many of them better, it's just... alright. I have never felt such a profound sense of mediocrity when playing a video game until now. This just has no character, and having the game's environment be Santa's Workshop doesn't help. It looks like an archetypal video game platformer version of Santa's Workshop. To put it another way, the Adams Family games were PC and Amiga ports that had some control issues, but the environments meshed with the title of the game. They felt like they were out of the Adams Family. They felt like they'd fit within the Adams Family house. There was a sense of character and a sense of place of those games this game lacks. Super James Bond, instead, simply just provokes a profound sense of apathy. My pick of the week would have been Mr. Nuts if it didn't cost so goddamn much. So instead, you have a way of playing PAL games, and most retro clone systems for the... Well, the uh, Super Nintendo now. Now we're getting even more of them with the, uh, with the Super Analog NT, plus the Retron 5 and other similar stuff. Makes it so, I'd, so that... This game was a lot more playable in the U.S. than it used to be. Able to support the Japanese version. It did get released there. It's a fun platform with a lot of character to it, and it's definitely worth your time. So as far as the rest of the best of the rest goes, we're probably going to be doing at least two, maybe three more episodes of Best of the Rest. And we're going to be going on probably a monthly schedule, just so I can get through all of these in a reasonable period of time. Well, not reasonable. Yeah, reasonable period of time, not so much in terms of number of episodes, but in terms of length of the episodes. So, next time, we'll be doing waiting things a little more on the action shooter side of things. We got a taste of that here, but there's going to be a lot more to come. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.